Hello and welcome to the DMBA podcast, where we share business confidence with designers. Hello, Joe. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here again. Yes, though, so for the new listeners, maybe you don't remember Joe. She was with us, I think, a couple of times, right? Yes, three rounds of the DMBA. No, but I mean the podcast. Oh, the podcast. I've been on the podcast twice because I was on the one, yeah. the like math quiz one where we have to do oh, pacing, that was a tough one. <laughs> uh, which is very fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you've, you've been on the podcast with the, how is this game called? Guestimation game, right? Yes. And then yeah. I think once with Andrea, where we discuss some business models ideas. Yep. Uh, but obviously you've also been with us as a mentor three times in the DMBA. Um, but yeah, uh, you're also uh, a listener of the DMBA, so the podcast, and like we frequently get messages from you about, hey, I like that, I enjoy this conversation. So I just thought it's a nice time for us to catch up again and maybe to hear what you've been uh, up to since, you know, fellow business designers always have interesting topics. So uh, you mentioned you want to talk t about negotiation uh, today, right? Yes, negotiation is a, a, a passion topic for me. Uh, I studied it when I was in business school, and I think it's something that had always been very scary to me, but I actually loved it. It was my favorite class by far in my MBA. And since then, it's something that I teach uh, at the different companies that I've worked at, but also like will force my friends to, uh, to role play negotiations with me all the time. And I think if you can have a mindset shift about it where you actually start to think about it as something that is really fun versus this daunting, scary thing. So that would but be my, my goal. <laughs> very rarely do I hear anyone say, I enjoy negotiating, right? I have one yeah. friend who enjoys negotiating and he likes negotiates all the time. I remember he even goes into a store and then he thinks about buying two suits and then he's like, do I get a discount for buy two suits instead of one? And then, you know, the, the worker goes back. I don't know what happens at the back, but they always go to the back office and then they come out and they say, oh, you can. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So I know, I know one person who enjoys negotiation. Now you would be the second one. So tell me, how do you, uh, become a person who enjoys negotiating? Yeah. So the thing that made me like it, and it's the, the whole theory of the type of negotiation I'm going to talk through with you today. But the idea is shifting your mind from thinking about negotiation as something that's distributive. So it's a fixed pie that you are just splitting up and any more that you give to the other party, you're then losing. It's win-lose. It's competitive. It's laden with conflict. Um, you're just trying to get more for yourself. So that's like the negative version of negotiation, but the, the kind of negotiation that I learned is called integrative negotiation. And the idea there is that when you go into a negotiation, the whole point is to learn more about the other person's interests and through that activity actually grow the pie for both of you because it's based on this idea that there will be certain things that are less important to you than they are to the other person and vice versa. And if you can identify those things and overweight for each of you on the things that matter to you most, you can actually create a bigger pie. It's a collaborative process because you're actually going in and learning about what matters to the other person. Um, it's, it's about going through this very, it's not about conflict at all. It's about a conversation mm -hmm. and trying to both get to a good outcome, understanding mutual interests. Uh, and I, in my mind, it's actually very similar to business design because I think mm -hmm. people think that design is all about creating more value for users. Business design is on the, the notion that, hey, if you don't have a good business case for that value for users, it's never going to make it out into the world and it won't be sustainable over time. So you actually have to create the business case for it to create that great value for, for others. And I think that integrative negotiation is the same idea of you can actually grow the pie for, for both sides. Is this something, it sounds like, let's put it differently. I know a lot of people who just become very stiff, like physically and mentally, as soon as they feel they're in the negotiation phase. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they just, yep. something just changes in their mind. And instead of being like in this free talking, open conversation where you could explore what they really want, they, something just flips and they becomes very like, they become very, def not defensive, but maybe like cautious and they don't want to say things. So, and what you're describing, um, I think I'm getting it, but it's like more, Hey, let's have a conversation about what you want out of it, but I want one of it. Let's be very collaborative, but yeah. that's not what 
most people probably identify, not identify, but um, have in their mind when they think about negotiation, and hence they approach it differently. So how do you actually make the other side open up and yeah. then share these things with you? Yeah, so it's... I think that there is prep work that goes in and you have to prepare on two things. You need to be really clear on your own priorities and also creative when you think through those priorities, thinking through multiple dimensions to them and what would be acceptable to you. Uh, but you also then need to use your own em empathy and insight into that person to take your best guess before going into that first conversation on what their priorities might be. Because the better informed you are on what theirs might be, and those become a starting off talking point when you're in the conversation and, and you refine them. But if you have a good sense of their priorities, then you're going to be able to come to a more creative solution. Um, there's actually this, this framework that you can use to lay out both your priorities and their priorities before even going in. So you have a sense of what might be on the table. Um, I would almost think of it as like going into a co-creation session where usually you'll be bringing in some stimulus into that to help, but you're thinking of it as a jumping off point for them to, the, it's like easier to react to something than nothing and that can help them then add into it. Right. So what's the framework? Tell yeah. Us. So the framework is, it's easy and, to remember. And also, <laughs> if you have any examples from your own life, we yep. can share along the framework. I think it helps just understanding better. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the framework is easy to remember because it's three T's. It's topics, targets, and trade-offs. And those are the things that you mm -hmm. want to outline for yourself and for um, the other party you're going to go into the negotiation with. So the topics are the things, are the matters that you're going to discuss in the negotiation. So I'm going to carry an example through for all of these. Probably the thing that we're, we all dread negotiating the most is salary. So I'll, I'll choose that one. So for salary, the topics under that, or sorry, accepting a job offer, the topics under that would be number one, your base pay. But there, and I think people overly focus just on that, but there's other things you can bring into the picture as well. So number two might be if there's, uh, a bonus or some kind of adjustable compensation based on performance. Um, the next would be your work schedule. So the assumption, at least in America, is always you're negotiating for a 40-hour work week, but actually maybe having flexibility in your time is really important to you. So maybe that's something else that you can bring in. Uh, there could be other things too, like paid time off or benefits or equity. Um, but I would say the big three usually are going to be base salary, um, if there's some kind of bonus range, and then actually what the work schedule would look like. So that's topics. The next thing is targets. So that is a range of what you might hope for for each topic. And what you want to have is the lowest end, and you want to be really clear that you will not accept anything below it, and then the best that you can hope for in a realistic world informed by research into the market. Um, so like for Target, for base pay, then you would go on Glassdoor in the U.S. or some source to find what is actually a normal range of pay for this role. Uh, for the like work schedule one, maybe you'd be on the you would be willing to accept a full time nine to five Monday through Friday. But you're hoping to get a 80 percent work week schedule with Fridays off. Um, and then somewhere mm -hmm. in the middle would be 80 percent. But that you can't always guarantee that it's Friday, for example. Um, and then finally, trade-off. So once you've listed out all of your topics and your targets for each topic, then you need to rank those topics in order of importance. And so actually for you, maybe you just had a baby, you need more flexibility in your life. The thing that matters the most to you is getting the right schedule for you. Next comes salary, next comes bonus. Maybe the thing that you care the most about is bonus. Maybe you have a mortgage payment and, and you need to have an ability if you do really well in a year to make an outsized return on that. Um, mm. And then finally, once you've listed out all of those things, then start to think about what might be some trade-offs across these. So maybe if you're able to get that flexible schedule, then that correlates to a lower base pay that you'd be willing to take. So then you're starting to think across the topics that you've laid out. And you do that for yourself, and then you do it for the other party on a worksheet, actually writing out what all of those things might be. And just doing this exercise really gets you, you in like, their mind and what they might be thinking about. You do it on your own without talking to them first? Yep. I would do your Got first it. guess on your own. Maybe uh, you can talk to other people, get their advice on what they think it might be for the other party, do as much research as you can at this point. This is like just a, a framework for you to gather all of your insights and research. And you said you're passionate about it. So I'm guessing you're not just using it at work. Like, is there any examples from your 
own the life that you are. <laughs> yes. I'm guessing you use this menu. <laughs> So maybe I've used it, but I mean, it's funny. My husband and I are going on vacation next week, um, and I, I don't know if I should admit this on the podcast, but I definitely use this when we plan out our vacations. Like now that we have a young kid, it's it's really hard to actually like get the time off. So when we do get the time off, I want to go somewhere really nice, and that we have different trade offs in our mind. We're like, it's I really like staying at a hotel over an Airbnb. Like, I just think it's a much okay. better experience. Uh, my husband's more into like being a local. He would be more into the Airbnb thing. Um, so then to me, actually, like the place we're staying is maybe more important, like the actual physical building you're staying in than the, the city that you're in. So for me, that would become like more important. But then I would actually give him more of a say over which towns we're going to be visiting. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely use it in my personal life. Um this actually brings me there's so there's a negotiation catchphrase, which is called your BATNA, and BATNA stands for best alternative to a negotiated agreement, uh, and okay. your BATNA is your walkaway price, and you need to be really really clear on it. Your BATNA is like if things devolve to such a point, you're just gonna walk away from the whole negotiation, and when you're really confident in your BATNA. It actually it makes you a better negotiator because you have a certain point at which it's no longer in your best interest to proceed. I and I usually will also have a batna in personal life negotiations as well, and my husband can tell when I've got my batna ready. <laughs> Are you batting me again, Joe? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> no, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, this, this reminds me of a couple of stories. One of them was when I was negotiating a, uh, rent, uh, when we moved to Ljubljana. So there was this, um, very shrewd businessman that we had to negotiate with. And it was basically a new, newly built building with like seven apartments. So he lived on the top floor penthouse, and then he had basically seven families, uh, paying off the mortgage, I guess. And so I knew we were in a good position because, you know, like, okay, there's seven apartments available, but still like he's, he's a person who sells yachts all the time to very rich people. So I'm guessing negotiating is his, um, his bread and butter. So I really got ready. And at that point I even like bought this book just because I wanted to be ready. You know, this book never split the difference. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the Bibles of negotiation and like, you know, I marked the pages, I read it. And I was really ready. But then I got there and he was like a thunderstorm. Like you couldn't really contain him in terms of like, he just, you could see the smoothness in his, the way he said things and how he presented it in a way. But ultimately like we knew what we wanted and that even though we didn't have all that smoothness and didn't have the talk or so, um, we were still able to, to get the deal that we wanted. But the way he got creative with like, it was very clear that the price is our top priority and he got very creative in how he was able to offer us this price. He said, okay, do you need the basement? And we looked at the, ourselves uh, at each other and like, not really. I mean, yes, we would like it, but okay. And he just like crossed it off. Uh, do you need uh, this couch? And we're like, mm, not really. <laughs> And he basically like, took all the furniture out of the apartment and then we got to the price that we wow. wanted. And um, yeah, it was a win-win in a way where it was just like, I, I walked away really impressed with the way he did it. Uh, even though he probably doesn't need that couch, it was just like trying to find a way to make it work, you know, I guess. It's such a good example too of like people often just fixate on that there's one very specific thing they're negotiating over the price, but the more things you can add in, the more creative you can be. and you talked about like he may have not needed the couch something i always think about when i'm going in to do a salary negotiation if the first thing that you put out gets accepted that might actually like leave a not great feeling on both sides because yeah. i think there's actually there is a fact finding that happens to the negotiation process where you mm -hmm. find out more about each other's priorities that in the end really bonds the two of you if things go well and so like it you should think that the more that you're able to have discussion, it's going to reveal more about the things that matter to both of you. One thing that this also makes me think of, though, there's two types of or two t um, different kinds of negotiation that you'll come across in your life. One is transactional, 
which is like, you have to, like, if you're in a suit shop, you have to negotiate once and you're probably never going to see this person again. Those, it is more fine to like, to be a little bit more distributive with it and try and get as much as you possibly can. But Mm -hmm. most of the important negotiations that happen in our life are going to be ongoing relationship driven negotiations, like with a manager at work or with someone you work with or with your own partner in your personal life. And so for those you never want to like burn any bridges, you really do want to get to the best outcome for both of you. And that's where growing the pie for both is so important. Mm. And I think focusing on like big wins in negotiation is also important. Like don't sweat the small stuff right away, but yeah. really focus on what's the big thing. Um, and also if you have 10 things to negotiate, start with the one that makes most sense. And I've heard somewhere that always negotiate percentages over absolute numbers first. Um, yeah. and that's like the example that we're given where like, I, if you have an interest rate, um, that you can negotiate like the, your mortgage rate, you know, um, that's more important to negotiate and to take your time to understand it well, than I don't know, going and buying shoes in a store. Yeah. By the way, another thing that I want to say is I'm really, I was really surprised when I got to the U S for the first time and I realized. So imagine this, I go to the Nike store and I, I find shoes that I really love. And here in Europe, you don't negotiate in stores. Yeah. And there's this really friendly person in this Nike store in San Francisco and they come over and like, Oh, can I help you with anything else? Blah, blah, blah. And like, Hey, I can give you this discount. And they basically gave me a discount without even asking. And this is the first time I realized, wait, are you, can you do this even? So. I wasn't aware because this is not a culture in Europe that you can negotiate yeah. prices in stores in the U S. So I wanted to ask you as a, uh, you know, like, is this normal? Like, and if it is normal in U S like in which stores, is it okay to do it in which stores it's not okay to do it? Yeah. So we actually do a lot of, uh, employee experience projects at profit. We've actually, we have worked with Nike and other retailers and often employees, frontline employees in the store are given permission to offer like a 15% discount and they're just empowered with it to make their own call on when to use it. Um, I know that I've done it in boutiques. 15% from now on, always 15%. (laughs) You know what you should always ask for whenever you're in a store, ask for the neighborhood discount. Often there's like a neighborhood. If you live in the neighborhood, you get 15% off. Uh, Just see, there's no harm. Can't you hear? (laughs) I'm definitely from here. I'm definitely (laughs) your neighbor. My accent doesn't give me away, right? (laughs) Um, you also reminded me of something really important when you're talking about the percentages, one concept called anchoring, which is something from behavioral economics, but essentially the first number that ever gets thrown out in any discussion, it's incredibly hard to move that far away from it. So Mm -hmm. if you can, you do always want to be the person to put out the first opening offer when you are getting into actually talking about numbers, because if you're able to anchor it on that number, it's not going to actually move that far in either direction. Whereas if they like that anchor becomes incredibly important and it's just very hard to move away from it. And then another point on that, I know that in the worksheet I was saying for each topic, you want to have a a target range, but never give anyone a range in negotiation, giving a range. Like, let's say that you said, I'd like to be able to work 60 to 80%. All you've said to them is 80%. You've just communicated Mm -hmm. whatever is the worst part of the range. And I think for people, it might feel less like abrasive or aggressive to give that range, but you're just saying the worst part of it. So find something in the middle probably and communicate that. Don't ever give a range. It's a good one. So does that mean that when you have uh, a vacancy at profit, you don't give ranges or like, is it required by law to say, Hey, this position is paid between this and this range? I know it's a little bit different, but just trying to understand who is the first one to go in the U S in terms of like oh, yeah. employer versus employee negotiation, because here it's yeah. like the norm is you need to set the base as an employer, what yeah. the employee can expect. So you kind of in that position already. So I can't speak for this on behalf of profit, but actually there are laws now in New York in particular that are requiring salary transparency for roles, which mm. I think is a great thing. Um, cause I think people should have a sense. I think it'll help a lot with, with equity and pay. Um, generally what I have experienced as an employee is that they will, the recruiter will ask you like, what would, what are your salary expectations before they come back to you? Got it. Yeah. It makes sense. Um, 
I think if we would to transfer this to, let's say, someone listening who either is a designer within working within an agency or a company, I think we kind of cover this through, hey, you can use this when you're negotiating a salary and so on. But maybe on the flip side of that, we have someone who is maybe running their own agency. I, what I was thinking now of is that when you're negotiating maybe terms with your clients, you don't need to just negotiate the full you know, some, you can also negotiate the way you're getting paid. So instead yeah. of waiting 90 days, you could maybe say, Hey, I want to get paid 50% upfront. Well, good luck with this, but maybe it goes through, you know, like maybe it works, especially if you give a discount. Uh, that's one thing. And the second, yeah, that's the big one. The second thing I wanted to say is that there is this thing I call normalization, which is like when I negotiated and I actually didn't, but let's say when I negotiated my first salary, um, what was normal for me was like much lower one day what, than what they offered. So obviously I didn't feel like, um, I didn't feel I have the power. I wasn't empowered to really negotiate on any higher number. But once I was in the company and I spoke with my colleagues and kind of saw what the normal salary is, then I felt like, oh, I, it's okay if I ask for more. And it's the same thing with like um, you negotiating anything. Like if you're just, you know, projecting your own thoughts and your expectations, your own finances, your own goals and wishes onto another person, you're kind of uh, maybe mm, underselling yourself or yeah. you could get more in negotiation if you really understood the other side better. So. This maybe now more applies to charging clients more, charging more as an employee, but like normalizing what is, uh, what you could charge, I think is a big part of that. So like talking to others in terms of what are they usually getting in this, in these deals really helps. Yeah. Which is kind of the research, the first step. Yeah. The research is so important. And like, if you work at an agency, you can actually have a pretty good sense of your value by thinking through how how are your services paid to clients? Is it time and materials or is it something else? That can actually give you a good sense of the amount of revenue you're bringing into the business. Because you do want to make sure that you're putting out numbers that are that make sense for you and make sense for the business. And if you put out something that would cost way more than they're actually even getting from you, that would seem tone deaf. So it's about showing that you understand your value and also understanding the role of that within the broader context. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I remember that in our, in my previous role, the way I tried to figure out, you know, my real salary was there was one document in which you could basically calculate how much a company would charge for the whole project. And basically you could put in your name, you could put in the name of someone else and you would just see their hourly rate. And yeah. usually this is not a big, um, uh, this is not a secret in agencies, you know, like, Hey, my hourly rate is this much. And I don't know, partners hourly rate is this much. Um, so being a business designer, I was kind of playing a little bit with proxies, you know, so this person is getting, so they're charging three times as much for this person than for me. Okay. I'm guessing they're not really getting three times as paid, but this means, you know, their salary is somewhere between probably around two times as big as mine, you know, like you can use yeah. these small little hacks and tricks to maybe figure out, uh, also these like figures or numbers that you are interested in. Yep. Yeah. The more information you have going here. in, <laughs> the more information you have going in though, that's just, it's going to make you so much more comfortable and, and hopefully maybe even excited to go in for that first conversation. So at which point did you get excited about negotiating? Was there like a tipping point? Was it you becoming so, a manager and having to negotiate more? And so the class that I took at NYU and my MBA with Professor Freeman, we would, every single class was role-playing negotiation. So we would have materials to prep us on each side. We would go through this process of filling out the worksheet to understand our interests and the other person's and show up in class and do the negotiation. And I just loved it. Like, I, I think first, I mean, it did really de-stress things because you are not actually that person. You are playing a role. But I found it was it was so fun. And for my brain, it was like the perfect mixture of something that's analytical because you have some facts going in and often there are some numbers you're negotiating around, but also really collaborative of thinking about how to get to a good creative solution with another person. 
Um, so I think as much as you can practicing it in low stress environments is great. Like whenever I have a friend who is going in for, a, um, an employment negotiation, we'll often just do it as a phone call together with me playing the other role. And I think that like with anything that's hard or stressful, the more that you do it, you get more comfortable with it. And eventually that challenge actually becomes fun. That's it's a good business idea. Hey, um, we're going to tr- probably it exists, right? So, Hey, you're prepping for your salary, uh, negotiation here. We can, um, have a role play call with you. Yeah. But actually I did hear that in the U S you even have the services where someone negotiates on your behalf. Is that right? Yeah. I think that they end up getting like a percentage. So it aligns incentives that they're trying to get you more. I think to me, the only problem there would be, I actually think that you create a stronger relationship through going through that negotiation together with the other party in a way that introducing another person and is not going to accomplish. And if the other person's BATNA is pretty good, they might be like, I don't even want to deal with this, (laughs) you know, (laughs) if they have another good alternative. Yeah, that, that I think is the most important thing is like going into the negotiation by just understanding what is your bottom line, yeah. um, really, you know, open up a spreadsheet or open up a notebook and really just write it down. What do you want? And sometimes we do have a feeling that we are in a, let's say worse position because we want this so much. And just acknowledge it, you know, like, okay, that's the case. I really want this fine. I'm going to take this and then through this build my, you know, my case further, but you know, you should at least know where you are. Um, yeah. One of my rules for negotiation is to just try to have as much of conversation as possible upfront before getting to negotiation about the whole setup. For example, like I'm just selling a plot of land that, uh, that, that I own and you know, when, when you meet these people who come and kind of have a viewing with, um, just try to understand their whole story. Like, you know, they're, what they're trying to build here. Um, they're trying to move from somewhere. What's their financial situation? What's their family situation? And through this, sometimes that actually often happens that through this, you get one or two pieces of information that become really crucial for the way you want to explain something, or maybe the way you want to negotiate about this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think you have to run, so we can also wrap it up here and we're going to bring you back, uh, again, and maybe then we can talk about, I think on the flip side of this, it's an interesting topic that you also brought up, which is pricing because price, pricing is in a way negotiating as well, but you just kind of anchor someone with, uh, with a certain price up front as well. Yep. That's true. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Joe, for taking the time. It was lovely catching up and um, yeah, hope to see you soon again. Thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun.